the local Moran statistic. So what is the local form of Moran psi? When we look very carefully at the way the statistic is constructed, especially for row standardized weights, then we can uh, discover that indeed the global statistic is a proportional to a sum of location-specific values. So as we know, for row standardized weights, the sum of all the weights equals the number of observations. So the S0 and the N cancel out in the numerator and denominator of the Moran's I expression. And as usual, we take the variables as deviations from the mean, or sometimes we standardize them. It doesn't really matter as long as they're not in the original uh, values. And then we can see that each component of the global of Moran's I is actually uh, Z, the value at I, times the sum over J over of Wij times Zj, which is the spatial lag at location I. And the whole thing is scaled by the second moment, the sum of squares. But the sum of squares is over all the observations. So that doesn't vary with location. So we could just replace it by some scaling factor. And, and for all practical purposes, we can ignore it. So the local statistic then is apart from the scaling factor, simply the product of the value observed at a location i times its spatial lag. So this summation over j of wij times zj, that is the spatial lag at location i. And remember, we already used this concept in the Moran scatter plot, where we had the spatial lag on the y-axis and the z of i on the x-axis. So that's it. That's the local statistic. And now if we look at it carefully, we see that the sum of the local statistics is n times the global statistic. Or if we reverse this, then we see that the global statistic is the average of the local statistics. So that's something we can use. We see you know, the global statistic just reflects a, a, a central tendency of the uh, local statistics. Now, how we get to that central tendency, that's where we might find interesting patterns of local instability or structural breaks, as we saw in the analysis of the Moran scatter plot. So now we have our statistic. We have one statistic for each location. How do we figure out whether it's significant or not? So the inference, as has been the case so far for all the spatial autocorrelation statistics, can be either analytical or computational. The analytical approximation is, is given in the original paper from 1995, but it's not very good. And it's not very good because it's a, an approximation to a local statistic, and the local concept of local it doesn't really lend itself very well to the notion of going to the limit, to the infinitely large population. So that's most likely why this doesn't work very well. Instead, we use a computational approach. This is based on a flavor of the permutation technique that we've seen before, and it's called conditional permutation. Why is it called conditional permutation? Because we keep the value observed at a given location out of the permutation exercise. Recall that the statistic is z at i times its spatial lag. So what we're going to do is hold the z i fixed at the location and then randomly reshuffle the rest of the values at the n minus 1 locations and let them fall as neighbors of i and we compute the local Moran. So we have to do this many times, in, as usual, to get our reference distribution. But the catch here is that we have to do this for each location. So luckily, there are some clever ways to do this in parallel that would speed this up. But otherwise, you can just imagine if you have 3,000 locations and you're going to do 999 random permutations for each of them, that's going to take a while. Okay. So we uh, carry out inference in the same way as we did before. 
of figuring out a pseudo p-value from the conditional permutation at each location. And so now we have all the pieces, we computed the statistic for each location, we assessed a pseudo p-value for each location, now what do we do with it? And there are basically two important visualizations associated with the local Moran statistic. One is called, or I call it, a local significance map. And this shows the locations that have a significant local statistic as determined by the pure permutation analysis, so it's a pseudo p-value, it's not an analytical p-value, but it doesn't really give you the sign of the statistic, it just shows you where it is significant. So this isn't really that useful for substantive interpretation, it just shows you which locations are significant and then how significant they are in terms of uh, different p-values that may be applied. Now, as we know, from our earlier discussion in the context of the Moran's eye and even the joint count statistics, the pseudo p-values, uh, the minimum of the pseudo p-value is determined by the number of permutations. So in order to get to a pseudo p-value with 0 0.0001, you have to do 9,999 permutations. And this is an example, an illustration of a local significance map where um, we used 75 districts in Nepal and we uh, get a measure of life expectancy. So the percentage of the population which is not expected to survive past 40, we used queen weights. And so the dark areas show that there is some clustering going on in that particular area. That is, but we don't really know whether it's actually a cluster or a spatial outlier. We just know that it's significant. And so um, what we really want to use, and this is something I call a local cluster map, is behind the scenes actually combination of this information on the local statistic information on its sign, and then information on where the particular location falls in the Moran scatter plot. As you may recall, the Moran scatter plot divides the type of spatial autocorrelation into four types. Two for positive spatial autocorrelation, which we call spatial clusters, clustering, and, and two for uh, negative spatial autocorrelation, which we're going to call spatial outliers. So the spatial clusters are in the high-high quadrant and the low-low quadrant. And remember, this is all relative to the mean. And then the spatial outliers are in the high-low and the low-high quadrant. So what we can do now is combine the information from the significance map, what we know about the sign of the statistic, and where the particular pair of the value at the location and its spatial lag falls in the Moran scatter plot to make a map with four different colors. And the colors are red for high high, dark blue for low low, light blue for low high spatial outliers, and uh, pinkish for high low spatial outliers. So in the example of um, Nepal, we see a pretty important grouping of 12 high-high districts. These are districts with basically high mortality, so low expectation of reaching uh, 40. And um, the dark blue ones are the opposite. The dark blue ones are uh, have higher life expectancy. And then the outliers are districts that either have a much lower life expectancy than the surrounding districts, and they tend to be at the edge of high, high, and low, low areas, clusters. So we see the, the blue one, which is a low one, right next to cluster of high values, and then the two pink ones are higher ones surrounded by low values. The cluster map is always given with a, a particular significance level as a cutoff point. So, in essence, 
we look at the significance map, we take all the locations that meet a particular criterion in the top map, that's 0.05, and then we figure out from the Moran scatter plot what quadrant they fall in and they get four different colors. The ones in gray are not significant and should be totally ignored. Even though there is a Moran's eye, local Moran's eye for those locations, it's irrelevant as we discussed earlier, when they're not significant, their sign doesn't matter, their magnitude doesn't matter, there's basically nothing there. Now when we tighten the p-value to say 0 0.01 at the bottom map, then we see that the clusters shrink. And in fact, in this particular example, there are no longer any outliers. So the evidence for outliers is actually fairly weak. It's there at 0.05, but it's no longer there at 0.01. And so this uh, has to do with how we interpret these results. We'll talk about that a little more at the end when we talk about some important issues. But the uh, upshot is, is that as you tighten the p-value, these areas shrink and become smaller and smaller. Now, what this actually means, and we can check back in a regular map. For example, here, we're at the top map, we have the, the cluster map again, and we see the high-low outlier. And then if we look at what's actually happening there, we have the little um, shaded area on the box map, and that shows that we have a light brown area surrounded by all blue areas. So the light brown is higher and the blue ones are lower. So relative to its neighbors, this particular location with the brown shade is much higher than the neighbors on average. And so that's the notion of the spatial lag, is the average of the neighbors. And we see this again and again, a basic principle of analyzing these spatial relationships is to compare the value at a location with the average of its neighbors. And the neighbors are defined through the weights matrix. So for different weight matrices, you'll have different neighbors, but it's always the same general concept. Now one issue that comes up is as to what exactly is a cluster, because what we have on the cluster map is the individual locations that are significant. But the cluster itself, we can think of as actually being more than just that, and being that location together with its neighbors. So we can use one of the features of Geoda to actually highlight the neighbors together with the particular value. And we see that, for example, the top map is at P01, and the bottom map, or P001, sorry, the bottom map has the neighbors highlighted. And now if you look at this, and then go back to the map that we saw here, then we see that in fact uh, 0.05 reflects this. And so even though theoretically, and in principle, we should really um, focus on the, the core as well as its neighbors. By relaxing the p-value to taking a less stringent p-value, you actually get these as the, as the collection of the cores themselves. So in other words, strictly speaking, the cluster is the core plus the neighbors, but of course that depends on the level of the p-value that you use. And for very small p-values, like in this example, p001, the cores will be very small. And if we add the neighbors to those cores, then we end up with regions that are very similar to the cores that we found for 0.05, for example. So this, this is a complication of how you interpret these maps. Uh, as I mentioned before, significance levels are really tricky because of multiple comparisons. Uh, we'll return to that in, in a few minutes. But the bottom line is, is that these local Moran statistics give you a fairly good idea of where things are different in the data set. So we see very clearly some structure popping up where in the northwest of the country, there are clearly lower life expectancies
than in the area centered around the capital Kathmandu. Next, we move to an alternative way of assessing these clusters, the local G statistics.